Hey everybody, welcome to another Off the Show Board Game Review. This week we're finishing our series on Mercenaries, a cooperative or competitive game for up to four players. Now, this is a game that was actually sent to me as a promotional copy, and I don't get a lot of promotional copies sent to me, well, simply because I'm a small little minnow in a moat around a large giant tower, so a lot of people don't send me a lot of copies of games. But that doesn't mean I'm going to give a game a pass just because I'm sent a free copy of the game. Now, before we go any further, I need to let you know that I've actually shot this review multiple times, and this is going to be my final opinion and just my final thoughts, and I'm try going to try not to go too ranty this time, at least that's my eventual goal. Because before we go anywhere, I just need to emphasize, I see the potential in this game. I see what the designers were trying to do, and it's got some rough edges, but I'd be a hypocrite not to mention rough edges, because if you go back and look at my earlier videos and my series of videos, well, I'll be honest, they're so darn terrible, I can't even bear to look at my earlier videos. But So don't go back and watch them because they're horrible, especially King of Tokyo. Can't even go back and watch it anymore. But my point here is that I see the potential in this game. I see the, what they were trying to do with the design of this game. But just like my earlier videos, this looks like a very, very rough start. And here's why. This game, I could sell this the heck out of this game if you would just take the theme of this game and ignore the mechanics ignore the graphical stuff about this game, if you just ignore all that and just look at the surface of this game, this is actually a really, really cool idea. Let me paint the picture for you here. This is a game that's played cooperatively or competitively, a la Legendary or something like that, which is a game that's a lot of fun. You have a lot of fun with Legendary, but you can play it cooperatively and competitively. That's a nice plus. That's kind of a cool idea. This is a fantasy adventure game where the players are mercenaries going through multiple rooms. That's what every one of these areas are. These area features are multiple rooms. Again, that's a cool idea. You're going through multiple rooms trying to hunt down an eventual bad guy so you can defeat that bad guy and win the game and save the day. Cool idea, right? You're going to be leveling up your adventurers by grabbing all these cards which are going to give your adventurers extra special abilities. Cool idea. Our adventurers are going to increase their power. They're going to get better. They have hit points. They need to fight competitively or cooperatively. Much like Legendary, they're trying to get victory points whereas the most victory points wins the game. Cool idea, right? It's all really cool ideas, but it's in the execution where the game starts to falter. And I'm going to go ahead and explain where this falters, why this falters, and where the problems are. And then after all this, I'm going to explain the graphical problems to finally top this all off. At its heart, Mercenaries is a very simple gateway style adventure game. It's a deck builder, kind of like the style of Legendary where players are playing cooperatively or competitively. But it's a much simpler game mechanically and also in how the game plays. Now, in the game of Mercenaries, the players are basically trying to go through this entire deck of monsters to get experience, to level up their guys, to get extra cards to play through, and to win the game. And then we have, well, okay, I'm going to put that off to the side now because I know I'm going to start ranting if I hit that point, and it's what I'm trying to avoid going on right here. There's, in the game, there's four different adventurers in the game, and they play differently, and that adds to the replay of the game. You have different adventurers that have different bad guys, they're going to play differently, have different abilities, add to the variety of the game. You have different ways these cards are going to be purchased because you have access to different kinds of cards as you level up the game, making those adventures feel a little bit differently. You have different area feature cards with those different adventures, again, adding to the replay. So basically, it's a simpler game. It's a deck builder game, competitive or cooperative, that has a lot of things built into it to add to the variety, add to the way the game is going to play, and add to the way you're going to play the game itself. Here's starting where we get to the problems of the game, though, because all that sounds really good, but now let's start looking at the problems of the game. First of all, first problem of the game, four adventures doesn't cut it. Four adventures is never going to cut it in this industry anymore, especially when you start looking at comp the competition and the way that they're all increasing the games. People want replay when they buy their board games. Now, you can back up, and the designers of this game have specifically told me that the idea for the game is to play these four adventures, then to start designing your own. There are zero instructions in this book. There are zero instructions or guidelines in this book on how to design your own adventures. So yes, you can do it, but there's no guidelines on how to build these decks, what kind of monsters include, what variety of monsters include, what amount of monsters include, which area features to build a balanced game. So basically, it sounds like, I'm making an assumption here, but since it's not in the rule book, this is the best I can do. It seems like they basically expect you just to pick some monsters, shuffle up the cards, and go for it and see if you can survive. I guess that kind of fits the mechanics of the game, but it also feels very light for me. Yes, this is a intro-level deck-building game, but that doesn't give an excuse to not include that in the rulebook. If you want people to start building their own adventures, you need to have rules to build your own adventures in there. 
don't make people assume because you have your advanced gamers and you have your basic gamers. This is a game for your basic intro deck building game type of game. It's a gateway game. Your gateway gamers are not going to be able to figure out how to build balanced adventures. Your advanced gamers, people who play advanced games such as Mage Knight and a lot of the other heavier games, might be able to figure out a way to balance the game, but this isn't going to be a game they're going to enjoy. So now we have a problem here. You don't have instructions on how to do it. That should have been in the rule book in the beginning. Four adventures doesn't cut it, and no way to actually build those adventures doesn't cut it either. You need more adventures in the rule book. Next up on this, we have a problem with the actual mechanics of the game. See, it is very, very easy to abuse the rules of this game for a simple reason. There is zero timer in the game at all. So if you play a cooperative game, it is extremely easy to abuse the rules and go ahead and level up your heroes to obscene amounts of power because there's nothing forcing you to advance the game at all. In the sample gameplay video, I do this just to show you exactly what I mean. It is very, very easy to have all the heroes equally build up with their experience and then have one hero who's kind of what we'll call a tanky hero, just to use a bad term, who has lots of defense and he will stand there toe to toe with the final mob right there while all of our heroes sit back, heal to complete life, however long it takes, it doesn't matter. There's no timer in the game. You take as much time as you want. The only timer is your boredom level or your self-imposed guilt about how you're abusing the rules of the game. Now you can play the game as a competitive game, which prevents you from doing this, but then again, you have other issues that I'll get to in just a moment, but let's just focus on this cooperative aspect right here. So this hero right here can buy a whole bunch of defensive cards and sit there and play those defensive cards and just sit there and let this monster plink at them until all of our heroes are fully healed up, kill the monster, move on to the next area, rinse and repeat. Now, of course, there is a little bit of a caveat to that if you happen to find a ranged monster who is going to randomly attack our heroes. And let's ignore the, how random that is just for a minute. But they're going to randomly attack the heroes. But it only gets one attack at all. So if our hero manages to corner it just like that, if this was a ranged monster, just to show an example, our heroes can still outheal the damage that's happening to do. Once our heroes are healed up, smack that monster, move on to the next area. It's very simple. It's very abusive. There's nothing in the game that causes more monsters to come out as the timer goes. Anything like that would have been preferable to add pressure to the heroes so they can't abuse the rules. That's not a good thing, and that's one of the first things I have a problem with. So now you ask yourself, well, okay, so there's a little bit of an error in the cooperative game. The competitive game obviously doesn't have that problem because the players are going to be their own built-in timer and because they're going to be going after the monsters. Sure, in theory, that works great, except for the fact that you realize only the person who lands the killing blow gets the victory points for the monster, not the people who did damage to it. Again, it's the person who lands the killing blow to the monster, kind of a lot, a lot, a lot like Arcadia Quest, where in that game, players are kind of trying to make sure they do a little bit of damage, a little bit of damage, and then one person wants to get the card, so they do the final killing blow against the monster. Except in this game, again, there's no timer at all. There's no pressure at all. So all the players will sit back and say, no, nope, I'm not going to land any killing blow. Well, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to get victory points. Why would I do it? There's no pressure. There's nothing built into the game to force you to do it. So why do it? Of course, you may say, well, the players are eventually going to do it. Otherwise, that's going to stalemate. Well, yeah, it will eventually stalemate, but again, there should be a design in there that forces players to do this. Let's take a game such as Marvel Legendary, where you have a timer where the monsters and the bad guys are slowly advancing across the board. The heroes sit back and say, I'm not going to do anything because I'm not going to get the victory points. The game's going to win. There's nothing like that built into this game. There's nothing forcing the players. So as a competitive and a cooperative game, you see how there's a little bit of an error in the design of the game there. Flipping back over to the cooperative style of gameplay, it's also a continuing abilities the way to abuse a system. Because it's very, very easy for one single player to buy a whole bunch of the defensive cards, and they effectively, to use a PC style game term, they become the tank of the group. They basically will walk up because we know that all the melee monsters are going to make a beeline for that hero, and they're pretty much going to stay as close to that hero as possible because that's the way the artificial intelligence of these monsters would work. So if we keep a couple ranged heroes back in the background, and this hero right here can keep enough defense cards, it's really not that hard to do, especially if you start off your early areas farming the monsters, and I'll show you exactly how that works in just a second. But this player, since your defensive cards stay in play, if we have two or three defense cards, each with two defense on them, we simply play them down, and then these monsters will beat on us, but nothing's going to happen 
because those defense cards stay and we're pretty much safe. The only thing we need to worry about is poison for those monsters, and poison is pretty easy to take care of too. You'll pretty much figure out how to do it when you play the game. So this player will sit here in the center, while the rest of these heroes will sit back in the back, and the only thing they're going to do is use a ranged attack to slowly plink away at these monsters. Again, it feels really abusive, but there's nothing in the rules stopping you from doing it. And again, I don't think that's really good design. I've seen other games where this is possible, but they built things in the rules to prevent you from doing it because that's a really bad idea because that strategy is going to fall apart. Now, in this case, the strategy works pretty darn well, actually. And this dovetails into the next thing that I'm kind of bothered about by this game. It gets very, very easy to farm experience on mobs, especially when you start running into area feature cards that allow the monsters to heal. Because remember, you're going to get an experience point every time you do a point of damage to a monster. So you can spread out your damage, make sure you do one point of damage to all these monsters, let them heal up, do a point of damage to them, let them heal up, do a point of damage, let them heal up. And again, it's I admit it, I'm not going to lie to you here. What I'm saying is stupid, cheesy stuff. It's horrible stuff. If anybody did that on my gaming table, I'd probably reach over and start throttling them. But again, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. And that's the difference between great design of a board game and okay design of a board game. A great board game such as Mage Knight has things built into the game that prevents you from cheesing the system. There's nothing built into here. It's basically your own conscious saying, hey guys, this is really lame. I'm not having any fun. Does anybody want to move on with the game? Everybody says, well, we can move on with the game or, well, let's go play another game. And that's probably what players are going to do. Because this is dovetail into my next point of this game. In this industry, we have a thousand games coming out every single year. These thousand games are competing for your gaming dollars, my gaming dollars, every single board gamer's gaming dollars. It's impossible for every single one of us to buy every one of these board games every year. Every board game has to either fall under two categories. It has to look good or play good or some combination of that. I mean, yeah, let's be honest. We're all, well, we all like our eye candy and everything like that. But I can take a game where, let's just say the game is okay. It's a decent game. But if it looks fantastic on the table, I can get it to the table because everybody's going to say, man, this game's so beautiful on the table. It's okay, but we still have fun with it. It's kind of a popcorn game, kind of like with popcorn movies, such as big games, movies with lots of explosions. The writing is not that great, but we enjoy it because it looks pretty. On the other end of the spectrum, we can have games that they may not look that gay, great, but the design of the game is so fantastic, you can get past the way the game looks. The game plays fantastic, looks okay, you're going to be like, Guys, the game doesn't look that pretty, but dang, this game is so much fun. Let's get this table game back to the table right now because we're having so much fun with it. And then, of course, there's the ultimate thing where a game looks fantastic and plays ultimately, or plays fantastically, looks fantastically, and that's what we all want as board games. And those are the games that reach the upper echelon. Those are the games that everybody's buying. Those are the games that everybody's enjoying. But this is a game that doesn't fit either one of those categories. The game plays okay with some abuses I've already explained. There's other abuses, but I'm not going to stretch out this video any further on that aspect. But the game plays okay with loopholes, and the game looks okay with loopholes, and let me go ahead and show what I mean by the way it looks. Now let's just look at the aesthetics of the game and the way the game looks. The first thing we'll start off with is the game board, which I actually thought was a very intriguing idea with lots of potential. It doesn't reach its full potential, but again, it's an idea with really cool potential. Because this board is laid out with tiles, and that's actually something I really enjoy. Let's take an example of a game such as Mage Knight. One of the things I like about Mage Knight is as you explore the game, you're building the board. So I actually enjoy games that have segmented boards. And this game does take advantage with it because there's actually an area feature card in this area feature deck, which causes part of the board to actually disappear. You actually take the middle sections of the board completely out, kind of creating a different aspect of the game. So they had a good idea, they just didn't really flesh it out enough. And I guess you could say that the idea is that you can build the board differently, but there's no scenarios that allow you to do that, and there's no suggestions how to build the board differently. So again, it's something that slipped right through the cracks. It's something they could have done, but they didn't do it at all. Next up, just how drab these tiles look. You have double-sided tiles, but again, they look exactly the same on both sides. Now again, going back to the eye candy thing, they could have very easily made one side, oh, I don't know, look like dungeon tiles, make the other side look like forest, make it look like trees, streams, anything just something to add a little more of eye candy to make the game look a little bit better. Because I'm not trying to say that us as board games, we're all shallow, but yeah, we like our eye candy. The better things look, the better we're more willing to accept that the game may be average or just slightly above average if it looks really, really fantastic. So next up, we have the art of the cards. And this, again, is something that kind of is lacking. 
if you look at the art of the cards, it just looks average. Okay, chain gauntlet, it looks like a chain gauntlet. Then we have cards such as Shield Bash, which looks like two rams ramming heads, which let alone doesn't really fit, but also look at the fact that the artwork is just average artwork, kind of average. This is the artwork for the Elven Bow. It's a little lasso, maybe a Wonder Woman lasso or something like that, but again, it looks very simple. Then you have another one such as Defense's Posture. It's one of those drawing mannequins that they give you in art school to help you learn how to draw. It's Defensive Posture. It shows one of these drawing mannequins with a little shield in front of it. Again, the artwork, okay, I'm not trying to claim that this artwork needs to be great, but the artwork should also be decent. I mean, let's look at other games. Let's just take examples such as games such as Elysium. And now I know Elysium has really good artwork, but let's just compare what the difference is between okay artwork and really good artwork. Let's look at cards such as, well, in my opinion, the Zeus cards probably have the weakest artwork out of all the artwork in Elysium. And that's not an insult because this game has great artwork and even the Zeus cards are great. But again, this is probably the most least fantastic art out of all those good artwork. So let's compare this artwork with this artwork. And again, you see where they kind of let the ball fall through the cracks. And yes, I get it. Artwork is, is expensive. But again, this is an industry where you need to stand out. You're trying to fight for the dollars between a thousand different board games that not everybody can buy. Would you buy Elysium or would you buy Mercenaries? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Am I being shallow by mentioning these or am I being truthful? Do we all really feel this way? Would we rather play a game that looks absolutely fantastic or would we rather play a game that looks pretty mediocre? And again, I'm not trying to harp on this. I'm just saying that you have so many potential opportunities lost. You have opportunities lost with the board. There could have been so many great things they could have done with different board layouts, multiple sided tiles, better artwork on the cards, better icon iconography. I mean, look at the experience. It just basically looks like something I took out of MS Paint or something like that. You can bear that with something such as Elysium, which has these wonderful looking wreaths and halos and different things to make it look better. Brings out the eye candy. It's just a simple little thing, but it's something we as gamers wholeheartedly appreciate. This artwork versus artwork such as things as Elysium, such as games as Battalia, games such as Legendary, games such as Smash Up. I'm mentioning only card games here. These are all games that have card in them, and all the artwork in them is much, much better than what you're getting in Mercenaries. This artwork right here. And not only do you have the artwork for these tokens that come with the game, and again, this is very simplistic. You have some very simple cross swords. You have the letters A and the F, which are basically taken from a font. Again, it's very, very simplistic. And that doesn't even include the fact that instead of having tokens to track your hit points, tokens to track your experience, you're forced to use this little pad of pen and paper to continuously track your hit points. And I can tell you, after about the fourth or fifth area in the game, this feels so darn cumbersome. You're going to take this and throw it away because you're going to be absolutely annoyed with having to pull out your pen and a paper constantly and track your hit points going up and down, your experience going up and down. It's just going to frustrate you. And you're going to do what I did. You're going to get some tokens to replace those hit point markers and those experience markers. But that should have came in the box right from the beginning. That should have been in the box right there. And then one final thing that is going to be a matter of preference, and I admit this is a matter of preference. That's why I saved this for the last. The final thing that I'm kind of frustrated with with the rules of the game is the fact that all of your experience cards go into your deck, clogging up your deck. Now, I've been playing deck building games for years. I understand the concept of having cards that are going to clog up your deck. But here's the point. You have 40 cards in this deck. Do the math here very, very quickly. If you play this game with three heroes, that means by the time you get towards the end of the game, every player is going to have at least 10 monster cards in their deck. You draw a hand of six cards every time you play the game. You can do the math and figure out that how many times are you going to get monsters in your hand? How many times is your hand going to be clogged up? How many times are you going to have rounds where you feel like, guys, I can't do anything. I have three monsters in my hand. I can move up and move up and nothing, guys. I'm going to throw this heal card down. My turn is over. There's no mechanic that actually weeds these cards out of your deck ever. Now, there's cards that allow you to bypass them by simply drawing these cards in your hand that allow you to dig through your deck and look for better cards. And yes, that works, but again, you're basically spending turns where you basically have turns where it's like, guys, I can do nothing, play a few hands. Guys, I can play nothing. Oh, wait, I got my card, allows me to dig. Okay, I can do something. Now, if you marry that with the fact that you're going to have one person standing up front, taking the brunt of the damage, 
Marry that with the fact that you can basically farm the experience. You can see that the challenge isn't really there, and it seems like the game feels like it's more of a slog because now we get to that very final point. I find it very, very anticlimactic that your objective isn't you find some final boss and defeat it. Your final objective is to simply go through all of these cards and then add up your victory points to win the game. Or if you're playing the cooperative game, get to that entire deck of cards before everybody's knocked down to zero or negative hit points. To me, that feels very anticlimactic. It's not very thematic because in my mind, the best fantasy stories are the ones where the heroes went off and tried to track down the ultimate bad guy, slew the ultimate bad guy, and saved the day. In this game, you're going to slay the ultimate bad guy and keep going. To me, that doesn't feel very thematic. Now again, this has been a fairly negative video review, and again, I had to do this. I have my loyalties to my viewers, not to producers who send out games, so I couldn't lie to you and try to tell you that this game is okay. I will tell you, though, that as a gateway game, the ideas in here are very sound. But as a release product that's ready to go out into the public, the game needs some work. I took some time to send an email to the producers of the game, telling them where I felt there were some discrepancies in the game, where I think they can make some improvements, and I really honestly hope they take those ideas to heart. Now, I'm not a board game designer. I'm not presumptuous enough to say that I'm a board game designer, but I am a board game reviewer who has reviewed 200 plus board games at this point, and I can tell the difference between a game that is ready to be released, such as Elysium, and a board game that needs to spend some more time in the oven because you have some mechanics that haven't been hashed out yet. That's my final opinions on Mercenaries. It's a game that had a lot of potential, a lot of good ideas, but it needs some more time in the oven. I hope you enjoyed this video series. If you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I'll be sure to answer them as quickly as I can. You can also feel free to email me at off the shelf board game reviews. That's OTSBGR at gmail.com. Be sure to answer your emails as quickly as I can. If you enjoy the channel, you enjoy the content. Like I've said many times before, this game channel is pretty much produced out of my own pocket. The board games, the mechanical equipment, and everything I use right here is basically paid for out of my own pocket. If you want to help support the channel, I just ask you to toss $1 over in the tip jar over at Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash OTSBGR. If you enjoyed this video, you enjoy this video series, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and thanks for watching.